My sermon this morning is entitled, A Faithful Father, and today we're looking at, uh, here we go, a scripture from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. I have the NIV translation this morning, and I've asked uh, Pastor Scott if he would uh, read that for us. You know, brothers, that our visit to you was not a failure. We had previously suffered and been insulted in Philippi, as you know. But with the help of our God, we dared to tell you the gospel, his gospel in spite of the strong opposition. For the appeal we made does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary. We speak as men approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please men, but God, who tests our heart. You know we never used flattery, nor did we put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. We were not looking for praise from men, nor from you or anyone else. <clears throat> as the apostles of Christ, we could have been a burden to you. But we were gentle among you, like a mother caring for her little children. We love you so much that we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well, because you have become so dear to us. Surely you remember, brothers, our toil and hardship. We worked night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preached the gospel of God to you. You are witnesses. And so is God, of the holy, righteous, and blameless, and blameless we were among you who believe. For we know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God, who calls you into his kingdom and glory. Amen. I'm double checking to make sure I'm not... I, I pull my mic down a little bit on the on the volume. That was uh, First uh, Corinthians uh, two and verses one to eleven. That's in the NIV translation. What did I say, please? Okay, First Thessalonians. I got to make sure my mind is in gear when my mouth is speaking. Okay. <clears throat> First, uh, Father's Day is when we pastors, we try our best to put out the, the best encouragement for dads. And so today is like that. We've got uh, some ideas to share with you, some things from the Word of God. Um, one of the things that's on my heart is uh, when we started the ministry in 1976, um, we were, I was ordained when I was 36, and uh, when we started, uh, the nuclear families in America, now that's one wife married to and living with one husband who has about two children, 2.2 I think it was back then, and <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well it's just statistical stuff. <laughs> So the end result is uh, uh, that after these 40 years, what we have is uh, down to 20% nuclear families. And uh, we are in, we're down to 20%. Oh, back then was 40. So it's a, it's a we're on a kind of like a, a descending scale here. Um, and, and, and fathers who join with their wives in raising their children emotionally, physically, spiritually, we're, um, we're refreshing, but we're in the minority. And uh, to, today the absentee father is a core of what I would call family dysfunction. Uh, in my files when I was going through this, I noticed I pulled up a, a statistic that was pretty scary about all the different things that happen when the father is missing from the home. Very important. Very important. So, so statisticians have interviewed hundreds of families to ask them this kind of question. What 
did persons, uh, the persons being interviewed, need the most from their fathers? Think about it while we're going through this. What did you need from your father? Uh, time was listed as top of the line. Listening skills. I was uh, very honored that my daughter mentioned that I'm a good listener, which is good. Uh, fairness, nurture, support, discipline, and quality time. Those are <clears throat> the things that uh, the offspring of fathers have mentioned. Now, who were the problem fathers that caused the most dysfunction in families? Um, in the, incidentally, in the 90s, we came up with the term dysfunctional family. And, and may I say that all families are dysfunctional. It's just that these families are the type of families that are most dysfunctional. Okay, number one is the substance abuser. And these substance abusive uh, fathers really cause difficulty in their families, not just in their, in their families, in, in the communities too. Uh, physical abusers, uh, that's what we work with on Thursday nights, the domestic violence perpetrators. Uh, they cause a great deal of harm to their families. The sexually abusive, they're in a minority, thank God, but they're still there. And then there's the, I call them the abandonment fathers. That's what's caused so much of the single parent households today, is fathers that are, well, uh, I can't help but be a little sarcastic. I call them adolescent baby makers. <laughs> they can make a baby, but they can't raise one. And I tell you, it takes a real man to raise a kid and uh, take them all the way through. Amen. And, and of course, this is not meant derisively, but the mentally ill also um, have a lot of disruption in their uh, relationships and with their families. So the sermon is, is written and given to encourage fathers to spend time with the children. Show the kids you care about them. Um, after all, that's uh, um, how kids see us in a sense. How they see us is how one day they'll see God. I had an awful time myself. Uh, seeing God as a father that would love me because when I would say our Heavenly Father my, my, my alcohol abusive dad always got in the way it kind of blocked my view it's kind of frustrating so if we're talking about a faithful father if you look at your outlines it's a great time to re-examine the gifts that we are given to our children uh, will they bring as we said to the children will they bring light or darkness will they bring blessing or cursing well, they produce, again, light or darkness. So um, look at Deuteronomy 6. It's a very powerful scripture that uh, the Jewish uh, Orthodox people especially. Have you ever heard of the word phylactery? You ever heard that term? The, the Jewish uh, uh, fathers uh, will, uh, when they go to worship especially, they'll wear a phylactery, which is a little leather pouch here. It's like a little box. And they wrap a strap around their arm to hold it on. And then they wear something that looks like a headband with a, with a phylactery, the little pouch here. And each one of those have these scriptures in them. They have, don't have the whole Bible, but they have this kind of passage that we're going to read right now in um, Deuteronomy 6. And these words, which I command you today, shall be in your heart. Would you read this with me, verse 7, together? You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. Amen. And boy, the, the Jewish uh, culture, boy, do they raise their children this way. My goodness. Um, so First Thessalonians was um, Apostle Paul's first written epistle for the New Testament. I didn't know that. And it was uh, written approximately 50 A.D. This epistle, it's a letter, was written to Paul's second missionary journey with Silas. He uh, stopped six weeks uh, at Thessalonica. Incidentally, if you're not sure where that is today, that's in Turkey. Okay? And he founded the church there. <clears throat> now, five things Paul does that profiles a faithful father. Number one, he demonstrates a fond affection. Uh, I tell the anger management people, they're mostly guys, but there are women too that come to those those uh, Thursday night classes. But I tell them, the tone of your voice condones what's happening. What the children are going to hear is the tone of your voice. You speak with a harsh tone, or you speak with a soft, gentle tone. Um, 
the um, my granddaughter Hope came to live with us um, at about um, in uh, '09, and I noticed right away that my testosterone voice frightened her. So I started raising my voice just a little bit when I would talk to her, <laughs> and the tone of my voice conveyed affection. Children need to hear that from dads. In verse 8, Paul says, we're just reminding you of what we just read. We love you so much that we were delighted. Now, if you're delighted with a child, the child will know it. I'll walk up to a little kid and I'll say to her, the, the mother, I'll say, that child has the face of an angel. The kid will smile, you know, <laughs> as well as the mom. She really likes that, you know. Uh, God bless her. But um, so... <clears throat> We were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well, because you had become so dear to us. Now, Paul loves these converts that uh, uh, they're his, uh, like a, a father loves his children. Um, they probably won them from the Jewish faith. And let me tell you, one of the problems that Paul faced because uh, he would go to the synagogues, and there he would evangelize. <laughs> well, where's a better place? These people already know the word of God and love it. And so he just wanted to tell them about the real God, not not the one that is we call Father, but the one we call Son, who, who is Jesus Christ. And so he would just get on his, his soap uh, box and start really going at it. So uh, in verse 11, um, he says, You know that we dealt with you, each of you as a father deals with his own children. Um, so he had a convincing love for those that he led to Christ. And, and, and Paul expresses a strong emotion for these spiritual children of his. Um, what father wouldn't be anxious, for example, about his offspring? I, I, I Incidentally, I looked that up because I was kind of curious about, I can't imagine Paul being anxious, you know, fearful, but yet that's exactly what the word is. The, the Greek word there is phobos, like we get the word phobia in English, and that's what it is. Uh, he has this, this fear that this seed of the Word of God and the Spirit of God will not be planted deeply, and so there will be no root and no growth. <clears throat> so you want the best for your children, trust me. Paul feels that he's conceived and birthed his spiritual children. Probably has. Um, I do not write these things to shame you, he says in 1 Corinthians 4.14. But as my beloved children, I warn you, for though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers. For in Christ, read that with me please, for in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Now, <laughs> one of the things that I think is so important is that um, uh, a healthy dad, is, is there to support, nurture, and love their offspring. And Paul had to leave uh, Thessal Thessalonica, uh, just like the previous place where he was, after just a little bit of time there. Just enough time to win some converts and get started in teaching in the Word of God. Now you understand, um, we go to a class today, I have, um, I'm studying a class in New Testament. Okay, so I'm going to go to that class in a college level, about an hour and a half class, twice a, twice a week. That's it. Now, Paul, when he began to teach, <laughs> you had to have lunch with you because <laughs> he wouldn't stop. He would just preach around the clock. There was one point in the book of Acts where he's preaching. He's preached all night long. And when some guy got up in the rafters and was holding on and lost his grip and fell. <laughs> and so Paul went over and had to pray for him and revive him. Uh, it's either a very long sermon or a very boring sermon. I don't think Paul would have been a boring person to listen to, but I think it was a really long sermon. But we're talking six or eight hours. He's going at it. <clears throat> you say, please, God, let him get hoarse. Lauren chide us anything. But he just kept going and going. Amen. So, um, Paul's, I kind of think Paul's thorn in the flesh here is interesting. Uh, I've heard say that the thorn in the flesh that Paul writes about was the fact that his eyes were bad. Um, but I think his thorn in the flesh was the fact that here's a guy who persecuted the church of Jesus Christ until that road to Damascus when God literally knocked him off his high horse. He got a vision of Jesus. 
and his life was transformed like that. He's first of all, he's faced with blindness. God let him stay for three days to see what he'd been walking in. You've been walking in darkness, Paul. And so he's blind. And so he finally sends up one of these guys he had been persecuting and tells him to uh, go in there um, and, and pray over him. Well, the guy, if I was the guy, I'd say, wait a minute, that's the guy that was chasing me around and beating me with a stick. I'm not going to go and, 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 and pray for him. But he went there, and he prayed for Paul, and he also... Um, led him to Christ, and he baptized him all at one time. And the minute I could just see that, I love that idea of a miracle in the in the baptismal thing. He gets he goes he goes um, into this 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 baptism. He comes out. He rubs the the water off his eyes, and he can see darkness to light. You know, I love that. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are come new. But I, Paul, Paul's sworn of the flesh, Phil Rowland's personal theory, these were angry, angry Jews. I think they were called by some theologians Judaizers that were following him around. And they were, he was up there going, Jesus will save you. And they're out there going, <laughs> you know, false God. Blah. You know, they're just really cutting him down. That's what I think the thorn in the flesh was, personally. It's just my thought. <clears throat> it's an interpretation. It's all it is. He didn't believe he was a heretic. Um, so they uh, they plagued him, but uh, Paul didn't abandon his flock. He was actually driven away. Uh, healthy dads do not abandon their offspring uh, for other people to raise. That's a really important thing. I, I I would just agonize over that myself. I think, well, are they raising my kid right? I want to be there to pay for it, pay for its expenses, and be sure its needs are met. Amen. Point two of my message, Paul profiles the healthy, the faithful, faithful father because he's willing to impart, I want you to underline the word impart, impart life, and underline the word life. Uh, there's two kinds of life in the New Testament. There's the, um, the biological life, blub, 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 and then there's this Zawain. It's a, uh, he that has the son, for, uh, John says in, in 1 John chapter 4, he that has the son has Zoan, and he does not have the son, does not have Zoan. And so Zoan is the life of Jesus Christ forever under the ages, time without end. You know, aeons, aeons and aeons, amazing. So when the earth is burned and there's nothing left, that life will still be in us. And I want you to notice he, uh, he says there, uh, has life. He doesn't say shall have. Got it right now, now present now. Very important to get that. Um, so e often we, we kind of walk in the flesh and we think, well, God, I'm not much of a spiritual person, but you better believe that God has stipulated you for heaven. If he knows if, if He knows you and you know him, if he knows your name, your, na your name is written on something called the Lamb's Book of Life. He does not forget your name. Amen. So, in verse 8, and the last part of the verse is really important. We just read the verse 8. Uh, we loved you so much that we were delighted, now I'm underlined, to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives. That's impartation. Because you had become so dear to us. The uh, faithful father then imparts life to his children. The question is, what kind of life do we impart as fathers? It's really important. Uh, fathers don't just instruct their children. I have one client I had uh, a number of years ago, maybe 10 years ago, and he got in trouble with his uh, wife. In fact, I think they ended up in a divorce over it because his idea of fatherhood was just to instruct. But he didn't show love to his children. He didn't love them. Children need uh, touching. They need affection. They need the tone of your voice to say, you're valued and you're important to me. Um, but impartation is that flow of what I call life to life. Uh, now, I was kind of adding up as I was preparing this message. In my education, let's see, I've got 12 years of elementary and high school. And then I've got two years of what you would call junior college. And I've got two and a half years of Bible college. Now, so that's a where I have to... 16, okay. And then I got three years of a graduate program. So, 
that's 18 or 19 years. In those particular years, I've had a, a good, easy, conservative estimate. A hundred instructors have tried to get things into my dense head. Some of it stuck. Some of it didn't. You know. But one of the things I noticed, there were lots of teachers, but only about one in ten of those people imparted life to me. And those impartation people, whenever I'd sit in their class, um, I'd sit up really close to the front. Because I want it to rub off on me, you know. I want to get close to the one that is my teacher and the one that loves me. Now, incidentally, that's a good argument for why we need to get close to Jesus. Amen? Because but you, you want him to rub off on you. He's the master teacher that imparts life to us. It's more than, more than he, he's just like Paul was. Paul got it. And, and from uh, on the road to Damascus, I don't think that guy's life, I just picture it again and again, amusing how God picked him out. God picked him to be an apostle to the nations. And he was, bi he was multilingual. He could speak four fluently in four different languages. I mean, what a great guy for a missionary, don't you think? <laughs> so he, he knew what he was doing. Real fathers share themselves with their children. Paul left a good part of himself behind as he left this budding church. Uh, loved his new disciples, and with a father's love, we've said that. Discipleship is more than, than just teaching facts and rote learning. Uh, the Greek word for dis uh, disciple is um, mathetes. Now, mathetes means learner. That's all it means. You know? and, and it doesn't mean convert. It doesn't mean putting a name on a church roll. It uh, has to become... I just think that discipleship itself is developing in people a, a, a lifelong hunger to learn more and more about Jesus. And, and that's just... To me, that's what discipleship is all about. Um, um, we just want to know more of God. And that's... It's a, if you ever, ever wonder... Uh, you've led somebody to Christ and you wonder if they really got it. Ask yourself this, since they've prayed to receive Christ into their life, do they have a hunger for God, for his word? That's the first thing people want to, want to know is, uh, let me tell me more about God's word. I know, need to know it. Um, in Psalm 119.11, you know the passage. Most of you have been in church. Your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Read that with me, please. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Amen. So, uh, I say fathers are not just what we call dine, dip, and drop with their uh, offspring. Now, let me explain that. I was raised Southern Baptist, and I'm not ranking on Baptists. I love Baptist people. And because they were the ones that birthed me in the kingdom, and they're the ones that nurtured me and got me started. But at the same time, there was a problem there, because occasionally we'd have these people that just wanted to, to dine them, yeah, that would wine and dine. That was what we call it. Uh, that was uh, win people into the Lord. Okay, and then they would dip them. That is baptism. We we believe, Baptists believed in immersion, so that's how we did it. And uh, and then we drop them, <laughs> put them on the church roll, and drop them. You know, dine, dip, and drop. So, but you know something? There's a lot of fathers that are the same way. You know, they do the same thing with their children. So we got to be careful about that. Uh, it was one of the our, our evangelical movement uh, is only 300 years old. I heard a teacher get up one time and she said, "They, they said the, the teacher said it this way, the disciple or really, he said, um, how do you think people got saved before 300 years ago when the evangelical movement had its beginning? How do you think they got saved? Do you think God still had people who was finding Christ before that? Absolutely. <laughs> there was always there were always people." who would find Christ through this word and, and through various methods. But since uh, in these last 300 years, the evangelical movement has slowly, slowly ritualized. Now, let me explain what a ritual is. A ritual is a sacred act that may or may not help you to feel closer to God. You know, and I'm not picking on Catholics, but that would just be one, for example. Does that make you feel close to God? Then do it. What is it that makes you feel close to God? You know, but the point is, you can do mindless acts. Uh, I've seen people go to church; they pick up their hymnal, or they look up on the wall and they see the projection of the the various uh, hymns and so forth. But they're not where their shoes are; they're a million miles away. So it's a ritual, then. You understand? 
So the, the, uh, the difference in the ritual and with the, the actual connection that we're trying to make when we come into worship is to find him in our hearts and in our lives. So he, we can find the application there. Amen. So, um, third point, Paul profiles a faithful father because thirdly, he is an example of hard work and unselfishness. Now, any, you, you dads in this room know what I'm talking about. Uh, you got up in the morning, you didn't want to get up at a quarter till six. You know, you didn't want to go through this routine. Maybe you're ache and, aches and pains or something. You just, but you did it anyway. You just kind of clenched your teeth and gutted it out and went and did it. But why? Because you love your wife. Because you love your children. Because you love your family. And so you sacrifice yourself. That's the point. Here's what uh, Paul said in verse 9, the first half of the verse especially. Surely you remember, brothers, our toil and hardship. Paul was not one that would go in, would you please get me a nice room in the Holiday Inn? I'd like to be cared for in the manner in which I wish to be accustomed. Or let's go to the Hilton Head or whatever the, what is that name of that that winter hotel? Tara's one. Well, yeah, I'd like to have a Tara room. Thank you very much. Okay, you get the idea. He said, we worked night and day in order to not be a burden to any of you while we preach the gospel to you. Now, Paul labored night and day. He preached the gospel during the day, and I've already told you it wasn't just, a, well, I'm going to give a nice little 20-minute sermon today. No, thank you. He would preach for hours. He was constantly uh, communicating the gospel to people. Uh, even when he was in prison, they would come and visit him with the prison. It wasn't just a little one-hour visit either. They were probably there with him for hours, just waiting for that impartation. And I'm sure it happened because look at the fruits of his labor. Yes, Cindy. Thank you. He's doing that. I picture him talking to the Lord while he's got this long needle with his leathery fingers. I don't know if they had thimbles back then or not, doing his tent making at night. I could picture him talking to the Lord a lot. That's a good, good input. Thank you. So the world is ripe for those who will not just preach the gospel, but will lay down their lives for what they believe. And, and, and God worked and earned his own money at night. I should say Paul did. Uh, and, and he was uh, willing to support himself, and that gave him credibility with the people he was preaching to. Uh, people are saying this today when they, you say, I'm a pastor, I'm a minister. They're looking at me like, are you for real? <laughs> they want to know that. You know, Are you a phony? Do you really love people? Because pastors, um, I ask young, young uh, initiates, or pe people say, I call them wannabes, they want to be a pastor. So I'll sit down with them, I'll say, let me ask you this, has God given you a supernatural love for people? If he has, then let's, let's, sit, and, let's sit and talk. Let's, let's see if we can help you get some right direction. If he hasn't, maybe you better find something else to do. You know, we, we have too many of the people who say, yeah, but I, one guy told me in, in Bible school, he said, I'm just looking forward to being in the ministry. He said, why? Oh, he said, I can sleep till 10 in the morning. And he says, I can uh, get up then and have a leisurely day, and I don't have to have any problems. Uh, I don't know. I worked 11 years in a community church, and you folks worked at least that long in that, that same kind of yeah, and you never got up at 10 in the morning. <laughs> you were out there on the firing line, and you were out there plugging along. Let's just say promoting the kingdom of God. That's what pastors are supposed to do, but they don't always do it. That's right. Oh, my gosh. Well, that's, hey, listen, you're not judging. Jesus called us fruit inspectors. He said, you'll know them by their fruit. Hello. <laughs> okay. Paul had uh, those then who were, uh, as well, who expected, uh, uh, had, try it again. Paul had those then as well as now that expected to be treated like royalty and their every need met. A real spiritual father doesn't take, they give. Amen. Effective fathers then impart and give to their offspring. The effective father, their attitude is everything. And, and uh, you ever heard the term stinking thinking? 
sometimes we can have a little problem here, and all of us in this room have been there before, and I have to kind of purge my thoughts every once in a while to make sure I'm thinking the right attitude, maintaining it. Father's attitude then, it's contagious, and he passes it on. The wife gets a pass, uh, positive attitude. The children get the positive a- attitude. Zig Ziglar, a very famous co- uh, Christian communicator, he said, your attitude, not your aptitude, will determine your altitude. <laughs> Which is, I like that way of putting it. So Paul forgets himself as he lays down his life for his friends. And then at the top of the next page, you understand, that br- reminds me of the beautiful words of Jesus in John fifteen thirteen: greater love. Read that with me, please. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. Amen. Paul's life as is a spiritual, Paul is a spiritual leader in the, in, in the home. In verse 9, surely you remember, brothers, our toil and hardship, that we work night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preach the gospel to you. Now, so who's the spiritual leader in your home? In my family, it was the mother, because my father was out to lunch. He, uh, six times he disappeared in my childhood. And uh, I could remember only three of those times. Some of those were before the age I could remember. Um, but uh, my mother, in a sense, had to be both parents to five children. And um, uh, in fact, I'd like to say that she had six children. And the oldest one was incorrigible. That was my father. <laughs> he who's a binge-drinking alcoholic. He just caused a lot of trouble for himself and for us. Now, do your kids have trouble calling God Heavenly Father? That would be a clue. Okay. So, there's three three kinds of fathers that uh, would cause a child to have trouble. The house policeman father, we already talked about that. These are the letter of the law people who uh, blow the whistle and they call out infractions of the rules. And uh, they, are, uh, they demand uh, instant obedience from their offspring. There's the insecure father who crawls into his cave and zones out when he comes home from work. He just sort of zones. He's in another world, you know. Uh, give, give a guy a remote, and pretty soon you'll you'll find out that he isn't even present. You know, he's just not 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 present in that room at all. Then there's a the hot-tempered father. I call him the family volcano. Explosive anger. Okay, and everybody walks on eggshells around. Mr. Hot-Tempered, okay. Um, Paul wasn't afraid to burn the midnight oil to, to unburden his children. Uh, he was bivocational. Today we call that term tent-making, just like Paul. And uh, incidentally, the sheepfold has always had bivocational people, in, in, including myself. Uh, I don't get my total uh, finances from the sheepfold. We just uh, There's certain things that the sheepfold has helped us with, but very... It, 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 otherwise, I'd be out there pounding the pavement, trying to and fr- trying to find a bigger building so I could have more people in, so I could make more money. Blah blah blah. You know, that's that's junk. That has nothing to do with the kingdom of God. It's the kingdom of men are like that, but not God. So, <clears throat> Paul was uh, his love for his sp- uh, spiritual offspring uh, was genuine, and they knew it. Last point of my message: we're running out of time. Paul is honest. You are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, verse 10, righteous and blameless we were among you who believed. The word holy, we always think of a halo and all that. All it simply means is we, we, we lived lives that were set apart. We just That's where it's agios. The, the Greek word here means to be set apart for a, a special purpose. And so uh, that's what holiness is. And they were holiness, holiness and they lived blameless lives. Uh, fathers, I'd say this. If you're wrong... Admit it. Now, I don't have time to, in this message today to talk about it, but more than once I had to apologize for my children, to my children. Lois is a great lady. She could come up to me, and I, she's my friend, always been a, for 54 years my friend. She could always tell me the truth. She'd say, you know, you were pretty hard on your, your son the other day. Did you know that? Hey, yeah. Well, she said, he's not eating well. He's, he really, really looks sad. Why don't you go and do something? So I went in there and I said, I know I hurt you, and I'm so sorry. Will you forgive me? It takes a lot of guts for a dad to do that. It's called humility, but it needs to be done because we're not perfect. But when we aren't, 
We need to have our own con- I wish I had the conscience. I did one time, another time I had the conscience to do that. No, I can remember two times with my children where I've been too harsh with them and the, and the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart. But that has to be very important. And that's where the, 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 the to me, the husband and wife are like a team in raising children. So important. Um, so uh, in a sense, I was learning myself because my, I didn't have a good role model. And so I was kind of like a pioneer in how to be a good dad. Sometimes I would get close to people I liked, and I'd try to do that. But there are nine words, folks. You married people, remember this. Nine words of power. I'm sorry. I was wrong. Will you forgive me? Powerful words. Husbands need to say it to wives. Wives to husband. Parents to children. (laughs) I think this applies to all of us. It's an agenda issue. Okay, and then there's this verbal affection. For you know that we deal with each of you as a father deals with his own children. Now, how, do, how does a father deal with Exhort, that means to upbuild the inner, uh, inner nature of the child. Encourage and charge them. Charge them. Go out there and do your best. Now, I have an awesome uh, story that I want you to listen to. It's a, it's a. Vit- we may have to turn out a couple of lights there. I want you to see this. I asked uh, Pastor Ron, and he, he, God bless him. He started his day early because of me, so he could get this ready for you. So I'm, I'm, I'm just honoring him because he is such a, a blessing to us. But he prepared this for me so I could share it with you. Okay, let's see if I can find this. Okay.
Lord, we ask your blessing on the dads in our room today in the sheepfold. And Father, thank you for Derek Redmond and his father that exemplified exactly what happens to us. You are there for us as a heavenly father <clears throat> would be there with his son. Time of great need. Bless your people. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.